Um, thank you all for coming, uh, for coming to SCALE. I always enjoy being at SCALE uh, and for coming to this. This is a new kind of format we've been experimenting with to do um, kind of an overview of CentOS and then a workshop so you can get some real hands-on experience with, uh, with packaging and doing stuff in CentOS. So um, we've been wanting to do this. We've been wanting to do uh, a larger presence at SCALE for a while. Um, so very excited to be here and doing this. Um, so what is CentOS? Um, now I'll have more slides on what is CentOS, but we have a whole ecosystem. The, what you might refer to as just CentOS is CentOS Stream. That's the operating system uh, that we'll talk about more, and that's kind of in the center of everything. But then we have all of these special interest groups around it. Um, and you can see that I'm going to get a graphic designer to actually make this look pretty at some point, but I made this, so it looks terrible. Um, you can see all of our, well, that's not even all of them. There are more special interest groups than that, but that's some of the more active ones. Um, that uh, do various things, um, build different package sets, um, do alternative packages sets, other images and stuff uh, around CentOS. Could you introduce yourself? Oh, hi. My name is Sean. Uh, I am the uh, CentOS community architect. And here, I'll let Carl introduce himself. Sure. Howdy, y'all. My name is Carl George. And uh, I am participating in the CentOS project, but also focus a lot on the Apple project, which we'll talk about on another slide. I think the logo's up there right now. Yeah. And also, I'm not on in camera frame, like I was just complaining about. <laughs> uh, yeah, Apple, this little logo here at the bottom. It's not part of the CentOS project, technically. It's part of the Fedora project, but very interrelated. And I'll talk about that more on the slide where that's appropriate. But yes, hi, I'm Carl. Yeah, so I will also get a graphic designer to make it. I, I wanted Apple on there because they're within the ecosystem, but they're not technically a CentOS SIG. So, um, so let's talk about CentOS Stream. Uh, CentOS Stream has a five-year life cycle, five five year and some months life cycle. Uh, there's a new major version every three years, um, and it is uh, it is where you get enterprise Linux from. It is it is where uh, RHEL is derived from, and any RHEL derivative systems ultimately come from CentOS Stream. Um, it branches. I'm just speaking and not following the slides. It branches off of Fedora. So every every three years, we take a Fedora release. Uh, and we make a branch point from that. Uh, and this year actually will be one of those branch years. So Fedora 40 will be coming out in a, a month or so? Like really soon, well, right? So Fedora 40. Oh, OK. Hold that thought. <laughs> I will hold that thought. OK, so uh, it's a long life cycle. We have a five-something five year uh, life cycle for CentOS. So there's about a two-year uh, two overlap uh, between when a um, the, the current or when, when one version of CentOS, um, the, the new one comes out and the old one is still there. Uh, it is not a rolling release, uh, even though that word has floated around even on some of our own blogs early on. Um, I think you know, people use the word rolling release to try to indicate it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have minor versions, right? There's no CentOS 9.1, 9.2. It just has CentOS 9. But that's not what people think of when you say rolling release. When you say rolling release, people think of something like Fedora Rawhide or uh, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, right, where there is no major release. It's just constantly getting updates, right? And that's not what happens in CentOS. Uh, in CentOS, we have a major release, uh, and it just gets updates within that major release, which is effectively the same um, kind of uh, uh, release cadence that you get on Fedora or most other distributions. They have a major release and then they get stable updates onto it. Is it possible to make this thing go away? Okay. Oh. And the updates that come onto CentOS Stream uh, are stable updates. These are generally updates that you've already seen in Fedora, either the update itself um, or it might be a backport of something that's already in a more current version, right? We maintain. Um, sometimes older versions of packages within CentOS Stream, so we have to do backports. Uh, but the, the, the features and the fixes that you see coming in are things that have already, uh, that you've usually already seen in Fedora, and they've, ta they've passed a bunch of gating checks and everything. So they're not, uh, they're not experimental new features. Um, they are stable updates. I'll interject there. The way I describe it, I might have put it on the slide before, maybe. Uh, yes, that last bullet point. I would call them rel style updates where if you're familiar with uh, how that works, we do a thing called in rel called backporting where the version of the software stays the same, but 
a bug fix or a security fix or something will get added as a patch to that older version. So you're like the software might be version 1.0, but then there's a security fix that came out in 1.2 but there's also a breaking change in 1.2. We want the security fix without the breaking change, so we take just the, just the changes we need for the security fix and backport them, basically making a soft fork of the software. Um, if the software ever got rebased like it does in Fedora Rawhide, you could drop those patches, but it typically, uh, I don't wanna say typically, there are some packages that get rebased in CentOS Stream. Um, I know that the, the Rust stack, for example, moves very fast and that gets rebased in every real minor version. So that'll get rebased in CentOS Stream first a few months ahead of time. Uh, but for most packages, there's a strong preference to backporting things and keeping the same version for stability versus rebasing to a new version. And the, the kernel is, I, like we stay on, I think we're on the 5.14 kernel. Uh, so we have 5.14, but it's like revision number 200 or something. Like that's how many backports get put Seven onto it. Into thousands yeah. For the uh, let's do, I'm gonna run the mic to them. Test, test. Ooh, that's sensitive. Don't hold it too close. Yeah, my question was, um, you don't update like the package version, right? But the only way you'd know the backport was done is to either look at the change log or to look at like the sources for the um, the patch in like from the spec file list, right? So like looking at the spec file or? Yeah, I can answer a little bit of that. Yes. Yeah, the, whew, that was sensitive, or I'm just really loud. Um, Definitely the change log. Uh, also, if you stay for the whole session, we do a, we're doing an RPM packaging workshop where I'm gonna get into that in-depth detail. It's the field called the release. If you've ever seen the string for the package, it's like you know 1.0-5. That, what I usually tell people is the first, first part before the hyphen is the upstream version, and the other number is the package version. So like the revision of the package. So the first one would be dash one, and then you need to add a patch, then it's dash two, and then you realize you, you forgot to ship a file that's supposed to be shipped with the software, then you do that in dash three, but it's all still version 1.0 of the upstream software is where you're starting from. Uh, that gets a little bit misleading when, like you mentioned in the kernel where you're on like, you know, dash 307, and because there's so many patches added, the upstream version is less and less relevant when you patch to that degree, but in a long life cycle distribution like CentOS Stream or RHEL, that it's unavoidable because you need to keep a lot of those versions the same for a long period of time. Did that cover it? Yeah. Definitely jump in with questions and I'll come out to you with the mic. Is, is, the, order, <laughs> is the order uh, Fedora first, then CentOS, then Red Hat? Next, next two slides. Yes, do we have that on the, uh, well that one shows. Okay, a couple slides ahead. Put a pin in that and yes. I have a sticker, actually, I have a, here, talk about it. Sure, uh, I'll go ahead and talk about it since we had a question. We don't, it doesn't really matter what, what order we talk about these in. So, this right here, can y'all see that or laser pointer on the screen at all? Good. So, historic, a lot of people come up and ask, I thought CentOS came after RHEL and I thought it was a rebuild of RHEL. And Traditionally, that was true. Um, in the past, we had the Fedora project. A version of Fedora would get uh, taken, basically taken internally private inside Red Hat and worked on for a year plus, and then all of a sudden kind of throw it over the wall open source that many engineers aren't a fan of because it's you're technically going from an open source project to closed development and then dump it over the wall open source. Like People that care about open source know that that's flawed and don't like that. Uh, but that's how rail development worked in the past. It was all private development and then thrown over the wall. Ta-da, it's open source, but you can't really do anything with it other than use it. Uh, the CentOS project will come along and use those sources to create a, what we would call a clone or rebuild of rail. Um, and I, I'm gonna go back a slide to talk about that one. But that's not how it works anymore. Uh, the new model that is a lot more sustainable and more interesting for people that care about open source is that we have Fedora and then it branches into CentOS. Uh, there's a period where it's like the early development and you probably don't want to start using it day to day yet. And then at some point we actually announce it as here, announcing CentOS Stream 10. And then about six months after that, that's when you see RHEL 10, um, which is, yeah. So here's how it worked in nine, a little bit more granular view. Um, Fedora Rawhide is the true rolling release in this ecosystem and uh, the, dot, the dashed lines are gonna be like development. So you'll have, a right, uh, not right now, but 
Fedora 34 branched off from Rawhide, got a little bit more polish, and then released as Fedora 34, maintained for a set amount of time. At the, around the same time, we branched off CentOS 9 development, worked on that for a little while, getting more polish, and then at a certain point, Rail 9 beta branched off of that, and then we did the CentOS Stream 9 announcement, and then a little while after that, Rail 9.0, 9.1, and so on, branched off from CentOS Stream 9 development, uh, or actual CentOS Stream 9. Uh, things change a lot between here and here. We're getting things stable for the, the whole life cycle, which the rail engineers controlling those packages, uh, they have to think about it, not just what we're putting in the next version of CentOS, but what is the business gonna have to support for 12, 14 years, depending on the extended stuff that they sell on that side of the house. Uh, and that's what it's gonna look like for 10. And this is, we are actually right about here right now. We're in the last bit of the Fedora 40 development. Um, thing we're about to break off the sync. We, we've already got the first initial composes to make sure everything works for CentOS Stream 10, but they're nowhere near the point where you should start using them. Um, once, once Fedora 40 is released, we're going to interrupt that sync. We're just using that to bootstrap things, and then independent development will happen for 10. Um, things like deciding exactly what version of the kernel they're going to use and exactly what version of OpenSSL is going to be used, things like that. That all is going to happen right around in here. Uh, but once we actually announce it as, you know, it's here, it's ready, you know, no one's ever going to say it's ready, but we'll announce it, and that'll be a good time to get on board and start using it, and that's around the time of the, uh, the five and a half years we mentioned. Uh, so going back to where we were before the great questions, keep them coming. Um, before I go on, was there any more questions about that kind of life cycle interaction and the branching? I know it's a lot of inf information dense. Can CentOS, CentOS Stream be used in a production environment? Totally. Absolutely. Uh, many of us do use it that way. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, I'll just call it, a lot of fud around that. A lot of people have tried to say, like, no, you can't use it now. It's too unstable. It's this totally different thing. But the reality is, if you actually look at it, the difference between RHEL and CentOS at any point is, like, 10%. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's 90 to 95%. The same software versions may have a few extra patches, things that are, as you can see in the diagram, uh, we're a little bit further back in time here, but what, what happens here in CentOS is what's being planned to go into RHEL 9.2. So it's not just exper it's not experimental. We have that on the not slide here. Yeah, it's not bleeding edge. It's not experimental. It's RHEL style updates. It's things that the business people want to put into the next RHEL minor version and breaking compatibility would literally break contracts with customers. So that's not what's gonna happen. Not that, fl that mistakes can't ever happen, they certainly can, but it's not just throw this against the wall and see what sticks. There's QA and stuff happens before it goes into the CentOS release. So I think it's great, uh, you're talking about using it in production, um, you get bug fixes before RHEL gets them uh, and, and a lot of security fixes as well. So I think it works a lot better in that use case. Um, one thing I will point out to people is that the traditional CentOS users that would use CentOS in like the first five years of the life cycle that care about those new features coming in the minor versions are a lot better. They, they like CentOS Stream, the new model, a lot better than the people that would use CentOS in the years five through 10 where they want it to not change at all. There's no more minor versions. Those people, and they want the 10 year life cycle as well, which CentOS doesn't have anymore. So those kind of people, there's gonna be a preference to something like RHEL or something that tries to copy RHEL, but CentOS, for people that were using it in the first five years, it's still, a, it's still a great operating system, still the same major version, very similar software, and works mostly the same way. It's, it's very function, functionally, it's basically the same. It's just the de development works a little bit different. Speaking of that development, do you want to talk about contributions? Yeah, sure. And I'll add to that. I, I think different people have different production environments, right? So uh, for some people, like the, those minor release um, branches are very important. Um, and for some people, they're, they're not. Like, if you're the kind of person who would, who would have gone straight from 9.4 to 9.5 as soon as it comes out, then CentOS Stream is, you know, perfectly fine. And if you're the kind of person that uh, would redo your system after five years, which a lot of people do, uh, but some people want these 10-year life cycles, minor, stable minor branches or whatever. Um, ooh, fancy. <clears throat> so it just, it, some of it depends on what your needs are in a production environment. Okay, 
So, um, CentOS Stream, um, I think we kind of actually addressed a lot of this. We a little bit, we've hit around so, it, yeah. danced around it. <clears throat> but some of the issues that we had with CentOS uh, as, a, as a rebuild project, as a, as, a, as a clone, is that you couldn't actually do anything, right? It was, uh, people like to say it was bug for bug compatible uh, with RHEL. And so, uh, if you were to file, file a bug against CentOS, the, the rebuild, saying, you know, this package is broken, um, or my application doesn't work in this environment or something, if you could re reproduce that bug in RHEL, well, then it's not a bug in CentOS, right? You need to go talk to Red Hat uh, and, and get it fixed in RHEL first. So, um, so with CentOS Stream, we're actually able to fix bugs uh, in CentOS uh, as they're happening. And in fact, that's how RHEL bugs are fixed. Like if you file, if you're a RHEL customer, uh, and you have an issue, I mean, you probably have an account rep or whatever, I don't, I don't work on the RHEL side of the house, so, uh, but you would talk to them, but it's all gonna go through CentOS Stream. Me, the, me neither, y'all aren't talking to salespeople. Yeah, I'm not neither a RHEL salespeople, I'm, I am, I'm, I am a CentOS promoter, so. And as someone, and I, I felt that pain a lot in the project, in the pre-Stream model and everything, uh, I felt that pain, I would file a bug with the project and then run headlong into like, yes, we see the problem, we reproduced it on RHEL, so we're going to close this bug because our goal is bu to be bug for bug compatible. Mm -hmm. That is a frustrating experience from the outside, from the contributor, the reporter, whatever. It's also a frustrating experience for the maintainers on the inside, which later I became. Uh, I, I, for a while, for a few years, I was uh, working directly on CentOS at work, and it's it's just a frustrating thing all around. Where you're just okay, you can use it 100% as is. You can't really, you can do your own changes to it, but. You know, you can't get anything into the distribution for the greater good for everyone else, which that's kind of, we kind of, we fixed the glitch in a way. Now, moving upstream of RHEL, uh, CentOS can accept those contributions. The RHEL maintainers now maintain their packages in CentOS also, and to fix it in the next version of RHEL, the next minor version, they work in CentOS, do that. Everyone using CentOS gets that change first there, and then it shows up for RHEL customers later. Uh, RHEL maintainers also have the option to do stuff in older minor releases, but there's a lot more red tape for that, and that's, frankly, it's off topic for this, but it is sort of tangentially related. There it is, that slide. Oh, I have, I have this as a sticker sheet. I'll put it out with the cookies I'll pass later. Them out. Um, oh, go back real quick. Yep. No. That's a clicker for the slides. If you want. Oh. Uh, one more. Mm. Um, yeah, not just the fixing the bugs ourselves. You can fix the bugs. You can actually do things. If you, you could report a bug and also say, I found, the, I found this flaw, uh, I identified the issue upstream, here's the commit that fixes it, and here's a pull request to add it as a patch to the package. And you can do all of that end to end, and the rel maintainer can just come along and say, yep, this all checks out and we should fix this. In, we should fix this in rel and in CentOS, merge, and then they do their work to get it in the product optionally into the older versions, older minor versions also. but. Their CentOS maintainers, who are now RHEL maintainers, are enabled to actually merge those contributions from the wider community rather than just closing down stuff as, you know, can't change it because we have to stay the same. I want to pass these out. Cool. <clears throat> All right, so that's CentOS Stream, which is, as I said, kind of the, the, the core operating system uh, that everything else is built around. But I want to talk more about kind of the rest of the project because CentOS Stream it is a good operating system, has a lot of good uses, uh, but I think some of the more exciting stuff happen with what we do uh, elsewhere within the project. Um, and so, first of all, we have actually a board, um, and the board is to set strategic direction for the CentOS project. It is not supposed to be a technical governing board, except it keeps getting kind of bogged down in some technical things because we don't have other ways to deal with them, which I'll address in a second. Um, so it's, it's 10 members. Uh, they are kind of self-appointed. Whenever, whenever there's an opening, uh, we have an open um, nomination process from the community and then the board votes on who will uh, fill that. We actually just went uh, through this process. We had a board member uh, step down and uh, we just went through the process of, uh, of appointing a new one. So. Um, and board members are, are able to serve for as long as they're, you know, able to serve. Um, people, you know, come and go and get busy with other things in life. So, um, 
All of the board members except one serve as individuals regardless of you know, who they're employed by. So if you're on the board as a Red Hat employee, you happen to be a Red Hat employee, but you are, you are supposed to be on there um, speaking for yourself uh, and not speaking for your employer. Um, and we have people on the board as well who are not Red Hat employees. Uh, the one, however, uh, is Brian Axelbeard, who is the Red Hat liaison. And his job is actually to act as the voice of Red Hat um, to the project. So any of the other Red Hat employees on the board are not speaking that sounds for so Red Hat. Is the voice of Red the Hat. The voice of Red Hat. <laughs> Brian, Brian, with his glorious beard, speaks for Red Hat. Um, but he doesn't have a magic veto power. The whole board operates on a, uh, on a consensus model. Um, so I mentioned that the board keeps getting bogged down in like these technical issues. And so a proposal that's going to go through soon, it's been through a few iterations here, is a SIG council. Uh, and this is basically a way for all of our special interest groups to, uh, to speak to infra, to speak to the stream engineering team, uh, and to have their voice heard, um, and to talk amongst each other, to say, oh, we've been having this problem in our SIG, or uh, you know, this problem over here, and you know, to work together to solve some of their common issues. Um, and this would be made up of uh, a chair from each of the SIGs, um, as well as people from stream engineering and RHEL engineering, and they'd have regular meetings to kind of work through everything. So uh, as I said, this is, a, this is an open issue, but I want to bring it up because it's, I think, actually a really important development in the project, giving us more of a, um, a technical board, allowing the board of directors to be a, a non-technical strategic uh, thing. Hey, Carl, do you want to talk about Apple? Apple is not part of CentOS, but I'm going to let Carl talk anyway. Sure. So I think I mentioned this earlier on in the, uh, in the intro about working on Apple. Apple, I'm not saying Apple. A lot of people think that with my hick accent I'm saying Apple like the hardware, like the iPhone, but no. Apple or Apple. Um, extra, it stands for Extra Packages for Enterprise Linux. Uh, it is part of the Fedora project, not technically part of the CentOS project, but all related and friends and uh, directly works with CentOS, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, well, right here on the last bullet. Uh, Apple basically is Fedora packages that have been built to target CentOS stream and RHEL, uh, which is a little easier to explain with this little diagram I made. Uh, these are little boxes to represent packages. It is not drawn to scale. There's way more than like 100 packages in Fedora, like I think like 60,000 last time I looked at it. Um, but around, I think like 6,000 of them or so, will basically, the slide earlier where I talked about branching off from Fedora, that's not all of Fedora. It's a subset of packages, basically the things that Red Hat wants to put in, into RHEL and support for the business for customers. Uh, that subset goes into first CentOS and then into RHEL. Everything else in Fedora is eligible to be built in the Apple repo and it basically just shows up like a di another Fedora release. If you're a Fedora package maintainer, uh, I see a couple of them in here that I know. Uh, you, you have your package and you have like the Fedora Rawhide branch at the front and then Fedora 40 is the one we're working on right now. That's its own branch. There's a Fedora 39 branch and so on. Apple just shows up for the maintainer as another branch of Fedora, even though it's not, but it is. Uh, so that's how that works. It's a way for you to maintain a package in, in Fedora and then say, I use this on Fedora on my desktop, but I also want to use it on my servers. Uh, so I'll request an Apple branch, build it, ship it there, and then it's built to be compatible with RHEL and CentOS. Um, there's actually a really cool talk. I would, I'm not going to take up too much time in this because this presentation is not about Apple specifically, but the CentOS Connect we did in, at, uh, at FOSDEM a month ago, uh, I have a talk that's on the YouTube channel about that where we are talking about the changes we're going to make for Apple 10. And if you've used Apple before or heard of it or interested in using any Fedora packages on RHEL or CentOS, uh, I would encourage you to go look at that. We're going to do some interesting things. We, because of a few different technical challenges, we created a thing called Apple Next to work with CentOS Stream. But we're going to flip that model on its head in Apple 10, and Apple is going to immediately target uh, CentOS 10, and then we're going to have minor version Apple branches to target the RHEL releases. So that way, CentOS is a first-class citizen for Apple packages rather than an optional afterthought that you might have to build for. Uh, so we're going to integrate it deeper and make it work a lot better, I think. Uh, but yeah, look on the CentOS channel on YouTube for that. Uh, 
what, an Appleton Roadmap or some, some title like that? Yeah, something like that. Appleton Overview, that's the yeah. title. So. Oh. Is this meant to be a, a supplement to, just for kids' questions. Okay. Is it meant to be a supplement to RPM and YUM or, or just specialized for packages? So Apple is RPM packages, 100%. Um, supplement, I would still say it is a supplement because they're designed, by, in the name, extra packages. They're additional RPM packages for, for RHEL and CentOS, things that aren't in the base distribution. Um, the first example that comes to mind, my mind isn't a valid example anymore, but in the older days, I think RHEL 7, uh, the only web server in the, in the main distribution was Apache, the Apache HTTPD server. Nginx was not in the base distribution, and you could get Nginx from Apple. Uh, that changed in 8. They added Nginx into the main distribution, so it's not a good example anymore. Um, KDE. KDE is a good example. GNOME is the only desktop offered in the base distribution, uh, but the Fedora KDE SIG also maintains KDE in Apple for RHEL and CentOS users. That's, that's a great example, mm -hmm. old GNOME. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, does that answer your question? Apple will take on the status of primary and, and the RPM and YUM will go away, or are all three going to be active for packaging? Not as long as I'm working on it. <laughs> I, I am an RPM packaging nerd. I like RPM. Apple has always been about RPM, RPM packages. Um, a lot would have to change for Apple to not be additional RPM packages, like so much that I don't think that's even feasible. I know that. Uh, there's a lot of move towards uh, what people call like uh, the atomic atomic stuff in Fedora, the immutability. Mm -hmm. um, but those are still built out of RPMs, and then there's RPM layering and other things like that. RPMs not going anywhere, and Apple only has RPM packages. Any other questions? What about the modules? Damn you. <laughs> <laughs> For the RPM packages that you're talking about, are you also going to include modules in, in uh, Apple for 9 and 10, or is that not a... I already know the answer to this, Jim. <laughs> Ringer. Um, so the question was about modules. Uh, if you've, you might have seen it before in Fedora modularity. Um, you came in at just the right time, Neil. Oh, I know. <laughs> modularity. Um, oh, yeah, so it was Jim that asked the question, so he's, he's trolling us slightly. Oh, um, so there was another technology. It was still based around RPM. Uh, the idea was that you could have parallel versions of RPMs in the same repository and through a DNF command configure which, ver which set of those RPMs you were going to look at, kind of like namespaces on a repository. Um, the idea, I love the idea. The implementation left a lot to be desired. Um, it didn't work very well. We actually did have an Apple, mo Apple 8 modular repo for a while. And, but because of infrastructure problems we had with it and other things we, and low usage, we eventually decided to just uh, shut it down and, and um, whatever, turn it off. And so we don't have that anymore. We didn't do it for nine ever, and we don't have any plans to do it in 10. And sneak peek, while RHEL, RHEL, 8, and RHEL 8 has a lot of modules, RHEL 9 has fewer, and RHEL 10 won't have any. So that is going away. That's an old technology. Don't really need to know that much about it other than it people that have been inside the project for a while, you, mention, you can mention it to them to make them cringe. Yep. Any other questions that are related to Apple? All right. No. All right, so I mentioned the special interest groups, uh, and I'm just gonna run through a few of them. I'm not gonna give a status report on all of them. Uh, they are all supposed to give a, uh, a quarterly update. Uh, we do a, a monthly-ish newsletter, so every month is, uh, you know, roughly a third of the SIGs giving a quarterly update. So you can just watch the CentOS blog uh, for those, and you'll see kind of what all the SIGs are doing. But I'm just going to, just a few of the more active SIGs. Um, there's a new integration SIG. So I mentioned, you know, everything, um, everything that we do all the updates that go into CentOS are, are tested. They pass a bunch of gating checks, right? Uh, and that ensures that CentOS stream itself is never broken, the operating system. But you don't run an operating system just to run an operating system. You run an operating system to run your applications. Uh, and so, yeah, right. 
And so the integration SIG has been working on uh, doing further tests to, to test the integration of the operating system with various applications to make sure uh, to make sure other people's stuff is not breaking with any updates. Um, you know, even if the updates are non-breaking, sometimes maybe you know your your application is depending on some obscure feature. I'm pretty sure there's an XKCD about this. So, uh, so if you have critical applications, yeah, if you have critical applications. Uh, running on CentOS Stream, you can work with the integration SIG to, to ensure that um, you know, things keep working for you. The way I'll um, describe that is rather than coming along after the fact and saying, hey, you broke my thing because you changed, you know, this maintainer changed a thing that they thought didn't affect anything in, in CentOS and RHEL, and it technically didn't, but they were building on it in a way that caused them to be affected. You can actually build in your own tests into that test suite and say that, hey, don't release this an update for this package again unless my use case works. So it can no longer just be you're getting it as is. You can actually have a little bit of ownership and, and make it your operating system too and say this is the way this works here is important to me. Please don't release stuff that breaks that. And I've got just some of the like recent accomplishments. I'm not going to do a readout of these, but I, I asked some of the SIGs to provide some of this stuff. Um, hey, let's talk about the hyperscale SIG. Hey, Neil. You're only on camera if you stand like here. Okay. Uh, Michelle. Oh, I sorry. Think, yeah. <laughs> Nothing down. Yeah, it's okay. So how do I put this thing on? You want the handheld? Yeah, I want the handheld. I don't want to figure out how to put this on. All right. So so this is where I need to stand? Yes. Okay. I hope. Uh, I hope so, too. <laughs> uh, so the hyperscale SIG. Uh, did not expect that. Uh, we do stuff around, I am one of the leads for the CentOS Hyperscale SIG. Uh, we do stuff around enabling CentOS stream deployments and large scale things like whether it's huge fleets of, of desktops and laptops or even larger fleets of servers and cloudy things and containers and all the whole things. So as part of that, we've done a whole lot of things in, in both CentOS stream itself contributing to the operating system. And again, as Carl mentioned earlier, it's about making it your own operating system, not just by adding tests to qualify that your, your stuff works the way it's expected, but also to change the stuff that's in CentOS Stream to benefit you and everyone else. So we've done some stuff here. If, you've, if you're familiar in the Linux space about how Linux Audio has actually shot up in, to be the best in the world, that's you know Pipewire and Wireplumber, and we did that along with making it pro audio work out of the box in CentOS Stream 9 and, of course, RHEL 9. And with SIG content, we do things like provide backports of various packages, including notably SystemD. Um, we provide, you know, Fedora-based kernel to add additional features that people want to do in the desktop and and servers, container images, expanded work state, uh, virtualization, and cloud images, and all this other stuff, all in service of being able to support our goal of providing people um, a high-quality experience to being able to use CentOS how they need to be able to use it or want to be able to use it. I think that's it for the hyperscale yeah. SIG. So. Thanks. I love, uh, I love talking about the hyperscale SIG because it's uh, basically entirely non-Red Hat, right? Yeah. Well, there's uh, one person. Okay. <laughs> but it, they're just like, okay, we could take CentOS Stream as a base and make something else that we want because sometimes there's stuff that, you know, maybe we don't want to put in CentOS Stream, but you could make a, a, a very different system uh, in the hyperscale SIG. And then some stems, Sometimes some of those things do end up in CentOS Stream, which is nice. Um, there's a KMod SIG, uh, which packages a bunch of kernel modules, again, for stuff that uh, maybe we don't want to put in CentOS Stream uh, for support reasons or whatever. Um, but they package up a bunch of kernel modules um, for things like different file systems or supporting various pieces of maybe obscure hardware. Um, but it's not obscure if you need it, right? So. Um, <coughs> So they uh, they build a bunch of uh, a bunch of kernel modules and they build them for both CentOS Stream uh, and they build it for RHEL and those those RHEL ones should be okay for uh, any of the kind of RHEL derivative systems out there. Um, the alternative images SIG is is another one of our new ones. So we have certain images that we produce operating system images you can download um, and you know install. Um, the alternative images SIG has sprung up to kind of create other images you might want to download. So right now what they've made are live images. They have a live image for, uh, for GNOME, 
and then one for, am I handing it back to, oh, no, we're taking a picture. <laughs> Neil is also involved in the alternative images SIG, uh, so, uh, but there's, there's a GNOME and a KDE live image, so if you want to run a live image, uh, there are, there are um, images for that. Uh, <clears throat> we'll have words afterwards. Um, but they're, they're working on a lot of other images too. So, you know, you could, you could imagine, say, images around, uh, you know, that, that already have certain other special interest group content en enabled uh, right off the bat. So you like don't have to kind of do that, stuff. like the hyperscale stuff. So you can get maybe a hyperscale image um, instead of doing CentOS and then adding hyperscale. I see a few new faces. Did anyone not get the sticker sheet that would like one? I'll come bring you one. Okay, yeah, we'll have him buy the cookies at the end. You have to give it to Jim as well. I did. I chased him down to give him one. Okay, good. All right, almost done. Um, there's an ISA SIG. This is also a fairly new one. Uh, and this SIG is investigating um, new, new CPU features. So the, uh, so the x86-64 architecture uh, gets new instructions and stuff from time to time. Uh, all of the CentOS stream... Uh, packages right now are built on the V2 baseline, uh, and the ISA SIG is currently investigating uh, basically building packages with a V3 pack a baseline, which allows it to use additional instructions in the x86-64 um, instruction set, which, you know, potentially can mean packages that perform better, and part of what they're doing is like, okay, let's build these packages with this different baseline and then run it through tests to see, um, you know, is there a better performance and is it worth... Uh, switching to that by default, which could, you know, maybe leave off some older systems. Sneak preview. I haven't seen anything publicly posted about those results yet, but talking to other people, I've heard chatter that um, at this point using V3 as a baseline for 10 is probably going to happen, like absent like a really big blocker that's like this, this particular customer is completely broken with that and needs us to be on V2. It's probably going to be V3 for 10. Sneak preview. Don't, don't tell your friends. Are we recorded? Uh, we have an automotive SIG. This is very cool. Uh, so one of the things Red Hat is working on is, a, is an in-vehicle operating system. Uh, and they do all of their work upstream uh, in CentOS. And so we have what's called AutoSD, which is a, um, it's basically a distribution of CentOS stream, but tuned for these automotive applications. Uh, and that is the work that would, that would feed into Red Hat's uh, vehicle operating system. Um, but it's something that you can, you can play around with too, just in um, you know in the community space and uh, try to make changes too. So, oh, they gave me a diagram of their uh, okay. accomplishments. I'm not going to do a readout, but you can see it. Um, there is a cloud sig. They're involved with uh, building both uh, stuff in the the OpenStack and the OpenShift ecosystems. So the RDO. Uh, distribution of OpenStack gets built within there. The OKD uh, upstream of OpenShift, uh, which is a Kubernetes distribution, gets built there. And they also uh, do, they build uh, SCOS, which is, CoreOS is a Fedora uh, image-based system, uh, but SCOS is basically CoreOS, but built from CentOS stream. So, yeah, both mic click, go for it. So one little parallel there I want to point out. Uh, for the auto automotive SIG, uh, what they all tell you a lot of times is that uh, AutoSD, uh, CentOS Stream Automotive Edition, or whatever you want to call it, is to uh, is to CentOS as Red Hat in vehicle operating system is to RHEL. So there's a parallel though there, uh, and that is similar to we don't have the diagram here, but that SCOS thing, Stream Core OS, is to CentOS Stream as Red Hat Core OS is to RHEL. So it's the different variants of it essentially. Minor detail. And then this is the last one. Uh, these are, I, I put them all on one slide because these are three like non-technical SIGs. All the other ones I told you about were like doing testing and packaging and building images. Uh, and these are three SIGs that do non-technical work, which is a really great way uh, to get involved if you if you're not a packager but you like to use CentOS and you want to get involved, you can get involved in one of these. Um, so we have uh, the promo SIG, which puts on events. Carl mentioned we had CentOS Connect at FOSDEM uh, last month. Um, or plans like our presence, you know, here at scale or manage social media, uh, an artwork SIG that does uh, artwork, unsurprisingly, 
It's and funny you said peop for people that aren't packagers, because I think that's what everyone's here for today, for the packaging, packaging workshop. Yeah, well, you can become a packager or not. Uh, and then uh, DocSig, which is uh, oddly enough newly formed. We had a Docs, not a SIG, for a very long time, and then uh, it finally got turned into a SIG. Um, and there's a lot of work happening there. Uh, one of the cool things is actually the, the, all of the RHEL documentation um, is, uh, is being developed in the open upstream and we're able to use it for CentOS. We just have to do a little bit of work uh, adapting it. So all of the kind of like uh, the, the, the user guides and stuff for administrators, uh, we can adapt to CentOS, but we have to kind of do the work in the community to do the adapting of that. Um, and we're also working on improving the contributors guide, which is um, not great, <coughs> to be honest. Um, and uh, there's various other things on here, and uh, we have recently had archived the, the wiki because it, um, it had a lot of issues, uh, but there's still some, some good content on there we want to pull out. So, um, so those are those, those three SIGs. It's a good place to get involved if you want. Um, and then are there any questions about that or anything on here or anything sent to us? Can you, can you maybe pull back the curtain a bit on kind of how, I guess, the people aspect of it? Like, uh, are there people that work on Fedora and uh, Red Hat uh, Enterprise, for example? Or are they, you know, once they take their curated packages, they don't ne necessarily communicate back to Fedora team? Or how does that work? So it's on one of the slides, if you go back. Yeah. The answer is it's, it's complicated. I'm trying to figure out how to it's say not it that in a sentence. It's a little complicated, but <laughs> let me find the one I'm thinking of. Is it the one that's on the Apple slide? No. Oh. Here we go. So I mentioned at various points talking about this that the uh, with the changes to CentOS, instead of just a handful of people rebuilding Rail and calling it as is and can't fix or change anything. Now, uh, we've blown the project up with literally thousands of uh, more maintainers because every RHEL maintainer is now a CentOS maintainer. So there's 100% overlap there. RHEL maintainers own their package in CentOS. Um, not every time, not 100%, but there's a lot of overlap with Fedora as well. So you have a package maintainer who is maintaining it in Fedora and let me go back to the... They're maintaining it across the board from Fedora into CentOS and Rail. Not all the time. Sometimes it's different maintainers. But there's a lot of it, the case where they have the package, they understand it, and they're like, all right, this change in the software is only appropriate for Fedora. Or this change is appropriate for, for Fedora, and then we're going to put it in the next Rail major, which means the next CentOS major. Or even talking discussions about putting the change into Rail, older Rail minor releases and how they weigh that with different red tape internally and other stuff like that. But they have a good overview of the whole ecosystem and relationship on how that works. And uh, not only that, a lot of these people got their jobs at Red Hat because they're involved in the upstream software project. So we're not just talking about packagers that know how the stuff works in Fedora, CentOS, and RHEL. They also know interact with the upstream project. Sometimes they're in leadership positions in the upstream projects. Sometimes they started the upstream project. So they understand the software. They're as subject matter expert as you can get and understand the whole life cycle of it and even understand, like, we can't make this change in the upstream project because of the downstream effects it's going to have in all these other places I manage it. Um, it's not 100% with that. There are some things where there's disconnect, and those are always areas that when we find it, we're like, hey, why are you not involved in your upstream yet? And try to work to correct that. <laughs> At the very least, get them involved in the Fedora packaging of it. But they, it, you know, Fedora does make different technical decisions uh, than, than CentOS. So as CentOS is... People will sometimes say, like, it, Fedora doesn't have an, an LTS release, right? Sometimes people refer to CentOS as the Fedora LTS. And I guess it's about as close as Fedora has to an LTS, but it does have uh, different technical decisions. It's not, we use, we'll use Fedora 40 as a branch point for CentOS Stream 10, but it's not a copy of Fedora 40. Some good basic, the, the most popular example people will talk about is that uh, Fedora defaults to ButterFS as a file system. And that's a, that's a decision that there were Red Hat people that were not fans of that. But Fedora's engineering steering committee voted on that and said, yes, this is the way we're going to go for this. So Fedora makes independent decisions, and Red Hat can make separate decisions. Decisions, though, made in CentOS, though, directly reflect what's going in the next minor version of RHEL. So those will be things that 
uh, Red Hat approves of. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna see ButterFS and CentOS until Red Hat's like, yes, ButterFS is going in RHEL. There, there's less disconnect there, but a lot more uh, freedom for Fedora to do things. But you can get ButterFS and CentOS thanks yeah. to our special interest groups. Two so of them, is, actually. Yeah. The, uh, the KMod SIG has a, a ButterFS kernel module package you can install, and there's also the Hyperscale kernel from the Hyperscale SIG that has ButterFS enabled. So multiple options to do that. More questions? Don't feel like you're holding us up between everyone and cookies. I'm kidding. For the uh, alternative images SIG, do you guys produce other image types besides ISOs, like container images or QCOW2 or, and I guess like how do you build all those different images if you do support them? So we could, uh, no one's asked. That, uh, so if you're interested in images that aren't uh, live ISOs, um, come and talk to us in the alternative images SIG and we can figure that out. Um, <clears throat> at the core of it, um, the image build tool that we use currently for our images in the alternative images SIG is a tool called Kiwi. And Kiwi is a very versatile tool that was originally made by the folks in the OpenSUSE project to produce images of all kinds, whether it's containers or virtual machines or cloud images or uh, disk images that auto expand when you flash them onto real computers or live ISOs. Right now we're using them to create live ISOs but if people show up and are interested in, in helping to make more stuff, by all means we could. Uh, Fedora, as, as related to this, based on the stuff that's been going on in, you know, I know someone asked about the relationship between Fedora and CentOS in this regard. Well, Hyperscale SIG and Alternative Images SIG doing the work that they did to enable creating what I will call Red Hat family distribution images. Um, that work fed into being able to do the change in Fedora 40, which is that they now use Kiwi to build their cloud and container images. Uh, so there's a symbiotic relationship, a very positive uh, cycle of contributions that benefit both, um, both groups very, in a very obvious ways. Any other questions here in the back? while I'm here with the mic, not a long walk. <laughs> Just came back here to rally up and get questions. All right, uh, then in that case, we will do a, a packaging workshop, uh, but first we'll take a, a break for about uh, 10 minutes or so. We can chat, socialize, and we have cookies and lemonade in the back. So enjoy the cookies. And don't, don't break for too long, people will disappear. And yeah. Not, not do the workshop. But yes, go enjoy the cookies and juice and uh, stick around for the, to learn how to make RPM packages.
All right, y'all ready to make some RPMs? All right. I'm I'm excited. We didn't lose that many people, so I know some, a few people came in and out. It's fine. It's not going to interest everyone. I know some people mainly interested in the CentOS project overview. That's fine. Um, some people like packaging uh, and scratches an itch in their brain, uh, being able to deliver software in the native system format. I'm one of those people, uh, so I like teaching this workshop. Yeah, Michelle and Neil, they're the same way. Um, it's not done to, done to appeal to everyone, but I'm glad that everyone is here wanting to try it out and see if it's something that does interest them. Uh, we're, this is going to be our RPM packaging workshop. I introduced myself at the start, but just again, for anyone that came in later, uh, my name is Carl George. Uh, I actually work directly on Apple that we talked about uh, for Red Hat. Red Hat pays me to work on Apple, not individual packages. The individual packages in Apple are all kind of unsupported from Red Hat, uh, but more just making sure that Apple is healthy overall. Um, those are, that's my contact info. I'll put it up on the last slide, too, if you want it. Uh, this is going to be a hands-on lab, uh, it, so I hope everyone brought laptops. Go ahead and open up that laptop and type in uh, bit.ly slash hello RPM, and that's going to take you to a, a hands-on lab that we will run through for this. So the way this workshop is going to work is that uh, we'll have some lecture and then some hands-on and then some more lecture and then some more hands-on. Uh, I've tried to split up the lecture so I'm not talking just at you entirely, uh, wake you up with some hands-on parts, but some of the lecture does go a little bit longer, and this, the last workshops are all workshops where I'll just, me and uh, Neil's going to help me. We're going to float around. If you have a question, whether it's about the, the packaging stuff, in the, the technical stuff in the lab, or just the lab platform, if it's not working correctly for you, just raise a hand. We'll come over and uh, help you out. I don't have a whiteboard anywhere to write down that URL for latecomers, do I? It's fine. If anyone comes in late, I'll just go back to this slide. So everyone who present so far has typed in this short URL, right? That everyone that's going to. You don't have. If you just want to watch and listen, that's fine too. But the hands-on part is the best part of this lab. But first, you got to listen to me drone on about geek out about stuff that I like. So. <laughs> what is RPM? Uh, it is originally RPM stood for Red Hat Package Manager. They have since uh, since changed that to just not be an acronym and be RPM itself. Uh, somebody told me that Scale did the same thing. Originally, Scale was Southern California Linux Expo, but to be more inclusive to non-Linux things, they're trying to unacronym that and just call it the Scale Conference. So, fun fun fact for the day. <laughs> So it's a recursive acronym, actually. Yeah. Neil corrected me. It's not just RPM. It's RPM Package Manager, like GNU's, not Unix. So yeah. recursive acronyms. <sighs> recursive acronyms bug me, but anyways. Uh, so but that's just the name. Uh, it is the package format for Fedora Linux, CentOS Stream that we've been talking about all, uh, all day or all in the session, and Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and many others. Uh, it's consumed by package managers on your system like DNF. Um, whenever, whenever I first started using Linux, one of the things that interested me the most was this whole idea of packages that rather than just going to download, you know, ISI or EXE files off the internet and run them on, and, you know, install them on Windows, having a central repository where you can just say, I know the name of the software I need, you know, such and such, install such and such, uh, that was just magic to me. I love that, hooked me in, kept me using Linux, and eventually I was able to build it into my job doing package management things on Linux. So uh, it's scratched, I mentioned it's scratching an itch for me. Uh, I like that part of it. I'm assuming everyone here uh, has at least used Linux before. Some, um, I think in the, uh, in the session we described it as, you know, basic command line familiarity is the prerequisite. Uh, so you've probably installed a package from the command line before. Uh, why would you want to package with RPM? Uh, I know we had a question about other ways of, uh, like, Apple using RPMs versus other type of packaging technologies. You know, you have all kinds of talk about things like uh, Flatpak and Snap and other different methods for getting software in a system. Um, RPM is a lot older, but the nice way to describe that is it's a lot more mature. Um, it lets you easily install, uh, remove, or upgrade software like any package manager would. It's got uh, commands where you can query your installed packages and also verify the files from that packages are in the right place, have the right checksum, right size, all of those things. Uh, each package, it's not just an archive of files. It is that, but it also has metadata inside, tied in with that archive 
to describe the package properties, uh, and more importantly, the, re the relationships with other packages. Each one of those packages doesn't exist in a silo by itself. It has its dependencies, it has things that it might conflict with, all those relationships. We'll get into those on a future slide. Um, RPM also lets you digitally sign packages to verify authenticity, uh, and you can distribute those packages in the re DNF repositories like I talked about, formerly known as YUM repositories, still technically defined in Etsy YUM repos.d, uh, but that's... Oh, RPM metadata repos. No. <laughs> I'm gonna call them YUM repos because they are, but anyways. Um, one of my favorite parts about RPM versus other like system level package managers is that there's a concept of pristine sources. Um, nothing, I don't have anything against Debian. Uh, I think they're a fine project. They do a lot of really good things. But one thing that bugs me about the Debian package format is that they have a, their system basically intersperses the packaging source with the upstream source in a Debian folder and they manage them together. And when a new upstream version of the software comes out, they have to rebase their changes in the Debian folder onto the new upstream software. And some people like that approach. I think it's bonkers and it doesn't work in my brain at all. I like the idea of separation of you've got the upstream source and the package source. Uh, and in, in the RPM docs, or at least in the old, there's a really old uh, book online called uh, Maximum RPM that uh, it describes them as pristine sources and that's a pretty good term for it. It makes it where when a new version of the upstream comes out, you don't have to do git repository management to rebase commits and packet patches and downstream changes. You just bring in the new upstream tarball and then try to build it and if it works correctly, then you know you're good. You, it might not build correctly and you might have to make changes to adjust for the new version, but you know, most of the time you won't. You can just bring in the new upstream tarball as is without picking through the changes in it and build it with your packaging source and most of the time get something out the other end that's usable right away. If anyone, I'm, I'm gonna go semi-quick through this. Uh, if anyone has a question, sh go ahead and shoot up your hand and ask. And I'll come bring out one of the mics or I'll see if Sean will do it for me. In fact, let me hand you that. It's off right now. Alrighty, so, so what actually is the RPM package itself? Um, I mentioned before that it is an archive. It's got the files that are going to go on your system when you install it, but also metadata about those files. Um, there are two main types of RPMs. Uh, you have the slightly misleadingly named binary RPMs uh, that contain the files that are going to be installed on your target system. Uh, the naming around there is kind of the idea that you'd have like a compiled binary, but it's not exclusively compiled binaries. You can have RPM, binary RPMs that are what we call no arch, where they are architecture independent. They're not a compiled binary. Maybe it's just Fedora wallpapers or a bash script. And it can be, because it's architecture independent, you can, uh, it's designated as no arch and can be installed on any architecture, ARM, x86, 64, whatever. Uh, but the correct terminology in the documentation is binary RPMs, even if it doesn't have any binaries. Weird artifact of time, don't worry too much about it. The other type of version, it, uh, type of RPM is a source RPM. Instead of the files that are going to be installed on your system, a source RPM has the software source code, that upstream tarball, like a tar GZ file, um, and also instructions for building that source code into a binary RPM. It could be as simple as putting that bash script in user bin whatever, or it might be having to run compiler commands or all kinds of other more complicated steps. So I mentioned the recipe for building the package, or the instructions for building the package. Uh, that's gonna be what we call the RPM spec file. Uh, it has a preamble section. It defines all of that metadata, uh, and we're gonna go into each of those one by one. And it also has the what's called the body. It'll have very, various sections that'll define stages of the build process. Um, this is also where we have like the change log and other things like that. Um, that's also part of the metadata. In that spec file, you can have conditions that give you the flexibility to use the same spec file for, say, Fedora and Apple, like we talked about, how it's just another branch of Fedora, or multiple versions of Fedora, or multiple versions of Apple, or even different operating systems. You could have one spec file that works and builds a correct package on both. Um, these conditions are in there. We'll go, on, go into the format of those next or soon. Um, oh, you can also say get those, that flexibility lets you do things like 
only apply this patch when building for rail eight, not rail nine and up, or only on ARCH 64, skip the test suite, run the test suite on every other architecture because it's broken on that one. Gives you flexibility for tasks like that. So inside the spec file, um, there is a thing we call RPM macros. That's gonna be a variable that lets you do text substitution. Uh, the syntax, it's uh, somewhat similar, to if you know bash variables, um, but instead of a dollar sign, a percent sign, uh, right up there. And the, uh, it has both with and without those curly brackets, and it actually is fairly similar to how that works in bash itself, if you're familiar with it. Uh, you can use the macro without the curly brackets, but if you have anything else on that line that might get confused with the macro name, you need to delineate it and say the macro name stops here with these curly brackets, and then there's some other text. That's the real purpose for that. Um, both styles can accept parameters that'll influence the output. Uh, because not all of them are just a straight, this macro has this exact string. Sometimes it is a, uh, it's, it can be Lua, Lua, um, what would you call the Lua language is built into the RPM, um, RPM package manager, so it is embedded. So you can actually do Lua things inside a macro that says, with this input, do these outputs and these other things. Um, you can define those, I talked about having them in the spec file, but you can also define those on your system itself. You c the, the main locations is similar to some other software, like I think System D made this a uh, similar structure where you've got something under user lib that is like the system vendor level uh, macros, and then you can have something under Etsy, which is like site local changes for macros that you wanna make, and then you also have a user level one in .rpm macros. You can set up that macro. If you put a, cur a question mark there at the front of the name inside curly brackets, that'll make it conditional to only expand when it's defined. So if you have the disk macro defined, it'll put in that text there. And if you don't have it defined, it'll not do any string at all. Um, it, without the question mark, you would just get the literal characters percent curly bracket, DIST curly bracket. Um, are you no, it's, it puts the, str the, the name of the thing exactly how you have it. it. Maybe that's a very new RPM thing. It, no. Usually you get errors because like oh, no, the percent. Because of where that is put. Right. I know what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. So like if you have an unexpanded macro inside your build section, it's feeding that into a bash interpreter and says that, uh, what, no foreground control, I think. Right. Percent symbol in bash does some stuff with foreground background commands. So you get that error. But what it's literally doing in the spec file is just putting in that exact text with, of an unexpanded macro. And you don't want that. So if you want it to be, con be optional, you put, use the question mark. Uh, another conditional form is not just inserting the ver value of the macro, but to insert some other text. So you could say like, if the rel macro is defined, insert the text dash dash disable this feature. Like think like a compiler flag. You're passing that into the compiler. Um, and so you can say only insert this text if this macro is defined, ignoring what the value of the macro actually is. Like in this case, rel could be defined as nine, but if it's all, if rel is defined at all, we're gonna put in this text in that spot. You can also explore those outside of the build process. Uh, we'll do, I think that's in one of the labs where you base, you run RPM dash dash eval or dash capital E and then the exact macro name uh, and that'll just evaluate that one macro by itself. Uh, you can also pass, for macros that take arguments, you can pass them along to it. Uh, that's why I have the, you don't actually need the quotes there for like a simple one like this, but if you're passing other arguments, you do need to put them inside the quotes so that bash doesn't interpret them separately. Uh, RPM dash dash show RC, that one is going to print out all of the defined macros that your system knows about. Um, not any in a spec file itself, but all the ones that I talked about in those locations right there, it'll print out all of those together. So you could actually see that, oh, I've got this thing defined in my home directory, and this one's defined system level, and so on and so forth. So some of the really common macros that we'll have is uh, files for file system paths. Uh, so like underscore bender is going to uh, evaluate out to user bin, uh, data dirt goes out to user share, sysconfder expands to slash etc, 
which I always hate that one because what it evaluates to is shorter than the number of characters of the macro itself, but that's that's my OCD acting up. So, Yes, but still, Etsy with the macro around it is still longer than just putting slash Etsy. But anyways, I digress. Uh, you can also do operating system properties, uh, like the rel macro I talked about, that's gonna be defined to the major version. Um, fun fact, since this is a CentOS uh, classroom thing, uh, rel is defined on CentOS also, so on CentOS Stream 9, the rel macro is also defined as 9. Um, because they're really dang close to each other, and I keep telling people of that, and not everyone <laughs> believes me. Yeah. But either way, 9, so you can have, if you use this conditional, that is saying that whenever it's major version rel 9, do this thing, or insert this text. Um, so the disk maker that I've been mentioning in a few places, that is a special one. Um, we haven't talked about version and release yet, that's coming up, but this lets you insert the string .el9, uh, and that makes sense later, uh, but the short version is that when you're building, using the same spec file to build for say rel 8 and rel 9, the resulting package in the release field is gonna end with .el9 or .el8 to indicate which thing it was built against. EL9 is literally, a, it's a little misleading, it evaluates to one, but think of that in the like bash one true type sense, like if one, do this thing. More common macros are build process helpers. Um, if you've been doing software on Linux for a while, uh, you might have, had to, might have found a project that wasn't in your repos and you wanted to do a custom compilation of it. You might be familiar with the traditional dance of dot slash configure, make and make install. Um, real classic way to design around a make file. Um, those will usually take extra arguments to help shape where it is. Like if you just run those without any arguments, you're gonna usually end up with stuff in user local, but that's not what we want for an RPM package. So we'll have, we have these macros like configure and make build that actually pass in all of the predefined arguments distribution wide to install things to the right locations like user bin instead of user local bin and uh, GCC flags and other things like that. It's better to use those macros because you wanna use the standardized distribution options for all of that compilation and installation uh, and not just whatever you come up with on the fly that may not account for everything that's necessary. Uh, there's also the auto setup uh, that's, uh, that is gonna be related to um, before you get started doing the build process and we'll get into the sections of that process later the first thing you have to do is extract that targz file uh, from the upstream source code and maybe optionally apply patches that you need onto that source code. That's what the auto setup maker is gonna do for you. Some more ones, uh, what, what I affectionately refer to as the legacy Python helpers, they still work, they're still good, they're not that bad, um, but py3 build and py3 install, that'll correspond to Python 3, set up py build with some extra flags and install the same way. Uh, if you've done py, you know, by hand installation of Python software, you might recognize that pattern. Um, we have more modern ones now. Uh, they're in Fedora and also in uh, CentOS 9 and RHEL 9. Uh, they're related to the, if you're familiar with Python projects moving from setup py files to pyproject.toml files, it's tied in with that. Uh, the pyproject macros can also uh, find and interpret the setup py stuff. So in Fedora, it's better to always use those Pi project things. Um, they work great in, in RHEL 9. They don't have all of the features in RHEL 8. There's some ongoing work to get those all backported and working. Uh, but there's also a thing in there called dy uh, dynamic build requires that is not gonna fully work on 8. <laughs> Frustrating Neil, yeah. very much. Uh, other patterns you might be familiar with from other software, we have macros for CMake, for Mason, uh, these are called, I think these are referred to as build systems, which is not the same thing as like a, an, a package build system like Koji and Fedora. Um, overloading of terms, it's frustrating and difficult. But yes, there's. Build framework. I just decreed that's the new term. But no, they describe themselves as build, themselves as build systems, I think. So, yeah. Uh, there's also test suite helpers. Uh, there's gonna be part of the spec file where you can actually run the upstream test suite, their unit tests. Hmm? Which one? Oh. Eh. These are just a few examples. <laughs> no hecklers, go. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> so you've got uh, some common ones. Py, the PyTest maker will, will run the PyTest uh, command with you know, packaging specific options, similar with ctest and 
Mason test. Um, so good. I get to take a break from talking at y'all and let y'all actually get to do some hands-on stuff and wake up. Um, right after this is the start of the lab. But what you're going to do in there, uh, there's a tool, a command called RPM Dev Setup Tree. Uh, it's in a package called RPM Dev Tools. Uh, and that is going to set up several directories that the RPM toolchain expects to exist. In your home directory, you'll have RPM build, and then build RPM sources, specs, and source RPMs. And during the, build, during the future labs, you'll see how each of those gets used. And that is the wonderful hands-on lab we're about to start. So that URL, did anyone need to see that URL again that came in later? No? All right. Um, if you're just shy, just ask me and I'll come by and tell you the URL. But uh, go ahead and uh, load that up, click the Start button, and follow the on-screen instructions. Unless you're an overachiever and already clicked Next and started without me. Some people, there's always someone that does it. Like, I'm starting the first lab, and they're like, all right, I finished all four, four labs. And I'm like, you're supposed to wait <laughs> for the, the, the lecture goes with it and teaches you as you go. But anyways, um, if you have a question, whether it's the lab platform itself or the instructions in the lab, this one's really straightforward. I think it's just two commands. Uh, but after that, uh, if you have any questions in any of the lab, just raise your hand. I'll come around. It's not going to be on mic. We're not shaming you in front of the class. Uh, do, no dumb questions, as they say. And I need to make note of the time, because this one, we'll give this lab about five, this lab's quick, maybe about five minutes. In about five minutes, if, uh, if anyone's still working on it, just raise your hand and I'll wait a few more minutes. But this one should be pretty quick for you.
Just an FYI, Neil here is going to be my sort of co-presenter helper. He's also going to float around and be available for any questions people have anything not working correctly. So feel free to ask him or me questions. I think a few more people are working, so it's been six minutes, but we'll give it a couple more minutes just to make sure we don't leave anyone behind. Another FYI, this lab actually is staying online, I don't want to say permanently, nothing's permanent, but it's not getting turned off at the end of this uh, workshop, so if you wanted to take this and do it again or share it with a friend, you can. Um, I think the lecture that goes with it is really valuable, but I, I'm trying to make it where the lab itself has enough instructions for someone to just go in and do the lab with those instructions there. Uh, so like, for example, like a friend of mine didn't bring his machine, so if he he's going to uh, later on, go to that same URL and do the lab, but just listen to the lecture right now. So that's an al also an option in case anyone didn't bring a, bring, bring a laptop. I was hoping we had notes in the, uh, in the program about bringing, a, bringing your own machine. Uh, we didn't get any hardware provided, but I don't see it listed there. So either messed up or didn't print it in the right field or whatever. Um, quick show of hands. No shame if you're still working on it, but I just want to know if I should go ahead or wait a few more minutes. Is, it, is anyone still working on this lab? We got one, two, okay, three. All right, yeah. Uh, we'll wait a few more, let people get all to the same page, and then uh, before we move on, just do the RPM dev setup tree stuff. You know, hit the next. Don't go on to the next part because we have lecture that goes on with it. Stop being an overachiever, Sean. Only click next once. Oh, so you're caught up. Cool. Okay. Like the one time I did this uh, lab at Summit, and um, during the first lab, somebody just had to tell me, like, all right, I finished all, like, four or five labs. And I'm like, cool, guy. Like, good for you. <laughs> You're first place. Move on. Awesome. I think everyone that raised their hand said they're good now. I keep getting blinded by the projector. So, just do a little more lecture. I got to bore you with my voice a little longer. Um, so that gave the lab we just did. That gives you the basic uh, tooling that we're going to use. But now let's talk about the spec file format itself. Um, so the first section is called the preamble. 
And this isn't going to do with the build process at all. This is all about the uh, the metadata for the package, and that includes like package rela relationships to other packages, and we'll get into those. Uh, but for just the plain metadata fields, uh, the name one, somewhat obvious, uh, it is the name of the package. Um, usually you're going to pick that name based on what the software is called upstream. It doesn't have to match the upstream, so you could do it differently. Uh, simple example, the upstream might always capitalize their, uh, their project name, but in the package you want to make it lowercase. Um, yeah, there's lots of ways to go about it. Um, I think the Fedora packaging guidelines have a preference to lowercase everything unless the upstream project specifically asks to keep a certain capitalization, which is fine. Um, uh, but there's there's lots of flexibility there. But yeah, it sh it sh it probably will match something upstream somewhat, just so people know what the, the package is. But what it does have to match is the file name of the spec files. So if you're packaging foobar, your spec file needs to be foobar.spec. The version of the software uh, that is going to be, I think I touched on this in one of the Q and A questions earlier. But the version that's going to correspond to the software's version upstream what they release the version as. Um, the release is basically another version, but that is the version of the packaging you're doing. Um, and you use that, ver that separate version to distinguish between different builds of the same upstream software version. Um, and I'll show that in some of these examples. But these three fields together, name, version, and release, they form uh, around like the Fedora project and other places that deal with a lot of RPMs, you'll hear the term NVR thrown out a lot. And that literally is the name, version, and release jam-packed together. Um, and that forms a really useful identifier. Like if you're explaining in a bug report which wh what version of the package you have installed, typically you'll use that NVR full identifier, not just the version, the upstream version by itself. Um, here's some examples. Uh, GNU awk package is named Gawk. And then you've got a hyphen, the upstream version, 421. And then another hyphen, a 4.el8. That dot el8, that, that is the disk maker we talked about earlier expanded to that. So when you build, you could build the same spec file and you'd get all of that dot el8 and then all of that dot el9, two separate packages built for different like C, you know, GCC lib and other things like that. Um, not GCC lib, um, glib2 is what I was thinking of. Different libraries, they'll build for the different, that indicates the target you've built for. Um, you can't just do the split on the hyphen though because package names, it's also valid to have a hyphen in the package name. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but you can have uh, a package name, vert what, with a hyphen in the middle, and then your version and your release field. Uh, the way I'll do it if I'm doing something custom in Python for like parsing this is uh, Python has an R split, split from the right, and then two fields. So from the right to the first hyphen is the release, and then from the right to the next hyphen is the version. Everything else is the name. Uh, and the one in the middle, that's just showing. What's that? Yeah, Python's string.r split. Yeah, I know, but like. <laughs> R split too. Anyways, um, and then the, the middle example, I just had that there to show some different versioning. Uh, some projects use like uh, this, I think it's called like octets, like something dot something dot something. Uh, there's a terminology called semantic versioning that that looks like, and I would not ever trust that an upstream is doing it just because it looks like it. Semantic versioning is a really good system that a lot of projects use something that looks like that uh, superficially that doesn't work like the semantic versioning rules at all. Um, you, you might native, yeah, you might, you might look at that and say like, oh, I understand that there's the major version and then like the feature version and then like the bug fix version. And that is what some projects do. That's close to like semantic versioning. It's a whole, whole schema, I guess, or like standard. Um, and it's great. I love it when people, when projects actually follow it. A lot of them don't. Um, for example, Python, love me some Python, but Python, the first two digits are basically the major version, like 3.12 or 3.13. Right, first two octets, yeah. they're not digits. Because that's something to, to point out, version, version numbers aren't really numbers, they're strings. Um, I had this conversation at a previous employer with someone, they were really bugged about the fact that um, like something.10 dot, something dot uh, evaluated differently than something.2. And I'm like, well, because it's a string of one zero, not uh, a decimal of dot one zero. Yep. And so, yeah. And because upstreams do all kinds of different versioning, like you might have something like the TZ Data Project that releases 2024A, 
and that's not alpha, that's just A, and then B, and then C, and then D, on and on. Um, yeah. You might also have alpha and beta uh, identifiers inside the version string. There's all kinds of ways upstreams can do this. RPM has pretty good logic on around evaluating that. It has to understand that so it understands what RPM is an upgrade for which other RPM. Um, but there are still things that can throw its sorting out uh, out of order, and we'll talk about that with this wonderful thing called epoch or epoch. Uh, this is a third version field, and uh, what it's used for. So, you, huh? The fourth? Oh, yeah. The name's not evaluated for the version comparisons. This is the third one. So. You've got the version and release that I talked about, like the upstream software version and the package version, sort of the release that you're doing of it. Um, but it, let's say you have an upstream project that decides that we were using versioning of 2024.01, but we don't like that anymore, and we want to switch to proper semantic versioning. Hooray, everyone loves this. And now we're going to be version 1.0.0 for our next release. But RPM's evaluation is going to look at those octet by octet uh, or section by section and say that 2024 is bigger than one, therefore this one on the left is a higher version and 1.0.0 is not gonna show as an upgrade when you do like a DNF update on your, or DNF upgrade on your system. Epoch is a, an, a bigger hammer. It is a super version in the spec file where you can say, I don't care what the default sorting is, this thing with an epoch is bigger than this other thing without an epoch or with a higher epoch. Uh, no epoch is basically an implied zero epoch. Normally you wouldn't have to, you don't have to put epoch zero in your spec files. You normally shouldn't have to touch this. Uh, it is few and far between where this is actually needed. Some people make mistakes and I've seen it before. Some, some packages you'll see in Fedora and CentOS and RHEL have a really high epoch, like 70. And there's no way that an upstream project has changed their versioning in a non-sorting way 70 times. It's just not, um, but there, <laughs> there was, I forget what, I forget which pack, I think Pearl has some like 40 or 50 epoch, but there's histor historical times where someone mistook the role of epoch in release, and they were bumping the epoch every time they made a packaging change, which technically works, but it's like a misuse of resources. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. So usually it's a mistake when it gets to an, a really crazy high uh, versioning. More likely you'll have just, uh, a no epoch at all or an epoch of one because one time the project made a non-default non sorting version path. Um, it is also possible that you might need to use, I had to use an epoch the other day. Um, I switched a package, uh, Python doc op, it's de basically dead upstream, hasn't been updated in like six or seven years, no, up no responses from the maintainer, it happens. You know, sometimes people, let's say the lottery factor and people, people, people talk about the bus factor, which does actually happen. Sadly, uh, my manager tells me use lottery factor because that's a lot more positive. Yeah, um, it's a lot happier. Yes, but they haven't touched the project in a while. That's fine. Somebody made a fork, uh, and somebody asked, "Hey, for this package, can you switch it to the maintained fork?" It's a lot of people involved standardizing around it. It's great. And I was like, "This makes perfect sense. I've done this in packages before. Switching to a maintained fork." But I didn't realize that with that switch, they didn't keep the the Python metadata name the same. They actually switched it from docop to docop ng, uh, corresponding to what's on PyPy, the Python package index. Um, and so that change caused some unintended side effects with the upgrade. And so I was able to go from, I think it was from version six, I upgraded it to version nine in the fork. And then I realized this is actually broken and not compatible software, I need to undo it. So it wasn't an upstream mistake or change, it was my mistake. And I was like, I need to actually force the upgrade path to go from six to nine back to six. And I did that with an epoch. So now epoch, epoch one version six is higher than version nine without an epoch. That's what it's for. It's, it's just a really big hammer when you, that you should save for last resort, break glass type scenario. We won't have to use that in this lab and you almost will, should never have to, probably not have to use it, but it's good to know that it exists if you need it. I hope you never need it. Yes. Oh. So, also in the spec file preamble, we're gonna have these other fields. The summary is exactly what it sounds like, short one line thing. Uh, you'll get, uh, we also, during the lab you installed a package called RPM Lint, we'll use that later in future labs, but it'll complain if your summary is longer than I think 80 characters. So you wanna keep that fairly short. Um, 
a lot of upstream projects will have like a um, a like a short description and a long description. The summary would correspond to the short description from upstream a lot of times. But this is up to you. It's just how you're defining it for the package metadata. How you want to describe it, how you want it to show up in like DNS, D, DNF search or DNF info. Uh, the license, that is going to be an identifier for the license of the software, like MIT or Apache 2.0, things like that. Um, small note on the license thing, Fedora is in the middle of a project to standardize. We had our own system for a long time because there was no standard for ad short identifiers. There is now the Linux Foundation's backed a thing called SPDX, and Fedora is standardizing on using SPDX identifiers across all of our packages. Uh, still work in progress. There's a lot of packages. Uh, RPM Lint in CentOS 9 and RHEL 9 doesn't understand those identifiers yet. So in the lab, for the sake of not getting an extra uh, linter error, we're using the old identifier. But if you start getting involved in Fedora packaging, know that those identifiers are technically wrong now and against the guidelines. Coincidence. He, Neil said that MIT is right on both because the, the legacy identifier and the SPDX identifier for MIT is d literally just MIT. Yes. yes. Unless you're using one of the weird MIT variants that used to be called MIT that is not MIT by itself anymore. Anyways, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tangent. You've got packagers like geeking out on stuff. But anyways, so summary license, uh, URL. That's just what it sounds like. It's a URL where you get more info about the software, either a project's homepage website or the GitHub repo or GitLab repo, whatever you want to call it. Um, just where you would go to get more info. The homepage of the software. Uh, build Arch. That is, I talked earlier about the binary RPM name being a little misleading. Um, build Arch, normally you don't have to define it. It's going to be defined in your packages you build based on what architecture you're building the packages, the system you're using to build them. Um, but if you want to build a no arch package that is valid on anything like, say, wall, wallpapers or bash scripts that are architecture independent, you can manually set build arch, no arch, and uh, define it that way, and then you'll get a package that isn't designated as specific to particular architectures. That would matter, like, let's say you're packaging up a bash script and you're just putting it in user bin, and then the resulting no arch package you want to be able to install on both your ARCH64 systems and your x86-64 systems. If you skip defining this, you get a package that only works on one or the other, arbitrarily set in the metadata, even though the actual contents would work on both. So this is the way you make it. You actually identify to the, build, to the package itself that you can work on multiple architectures. You're not, you don't have any architecture-specific files. More preamble sections. The source. Uh, this is going to be a file name or a URL to a file that you need to build the package. You'll, this is where you'll, the first one you'll see usually is the source code archive link, uh, like a Git, GitHub download URL or like if the upstream project has their own file server they publish their archives, their, their tar, tarballs under, you, you could use that. Um, you could also use it for things like a default configuration file uh, that maybe it's just locally with your spec file, maybe it's at a URL somewhere online. It can be either one. Uh, then you also have patch uh, tags. These are similar to source. It's either a file name that you have right there alongside your spec file or a URL to a patch file uh, that you're going to apply to the source code to make small changes. You can use both of these tags multiple times and optionally suffix them with digits. Um, in Fedora, so the suffix with the digit is actually mandatory on RHEL 7 and RHEL 8, I believe. RHEL 9, it's not, you can use unversioned. Um, it's a little, so I, th I think it's a little cleaner to use the unversioned one, and I would only mess with the version uh, source and patch if I had to specifically do something with one of the sources or one of the patches. If you've just got a source tarball in three patches, you don't have to number that because that can all be applied automatically. If you want one of your patches to only be applied like on ARCH64, then you would might, might want to number them so you could say only apply this specific patch number, things like that. So now getting into the other, the, the more important type of metadata, I think, uh, your package relationships. So the first one is build requires. Uh, these are going to be packages you need in order to build your package, uh, also known as build time dependencies, as opposed to requires. That's going to be packages that you need to install this package or runtime requires. Uh, good difference there. 
And it's important that you, those are separate fields. Some people say like, oh, well, anything that is required, I'm going to have at build time. And that's not true. You can have runtime only dependencies that aren't necessary to build your software in any way. Um, so you have control there and you, uh, it's a little duplication if you have a long list of dependencies, but it's not that bad. It's better to have it a little bit more explicit, I think. Uh, recommends is a l slightly newer one. Uh, I believe it works in CentOS 8 and 9, but not 7. Um, of course you remember the exact version that <laughs> introduced him. <laughs> um, but yes, recommends, it's called what's called a weak dependency. It functions like a requires, like a runtime dependency, uh, and it'll be installed by default. But the difference is, is that you could actually remove it and not remove the package that depend that soft that had a weak dependency on it, uh, making it an optional dependency. You could also configure your system to skip the optional, skip the recommends and optional dependencies uh, anytime. Supplements is really cool. That is what I call a reverse recommends. There's no uh, requires equivalent to it, but basically with the supplements, uh, the example I like to give is, think about, think you have a piece of software and then you have plugins for that software and those plugins change over time. You package new ones, add them, you might remove some. Uh, if you use recommends for it, the main software to pull in all the plugins, you'd have to enumerate all of the plugins in the main software spec file, and then if any of them change, update that list of recommends in the main spec file. Alternatively, you can use supplements and have every spec file supplement the main package, and then when you remove, if you remove or add a new package, you don't have to update the main package at all, it's because it's working in the opposite direction. It's saying, I'm an optional dependency for this thing, and it just gets pulled in and recognized. Conflicts, uh, that means packages that can't be installed at the same time. It's better to avoid this one uh, if you can, but sometimes it is unavoidable, kind of like the epoch thing. Usually where this will come in into play is file path conflicts. Uh, you might have two uh, completely unrelated software uh, programs that both install, a pro they both install user bin uh, foo, or user bin, uh, user bin convert I think is one that uh, we have to deal with that this software has it, but this other software completely unrelated also has it, n and you neither upstream wants to rename their program, but there's a namespace collision, so the only thing we can do, if you don't do anything, DNF will let you try to install them. It'll start that transaction, and after it's downloaded the, the RPMs and tries to install them, it'll abort and say, I actually can't install these because they both have a file at this spot, and that's not gonna work. You can uh, tell DNF ahead of time that these two packages can't be installed at the same time with that conflicts directive, so it will actually tell you before it downloads those RPMs. It'll look at the metadata, say, nope, these two conflict, and that breaks the transaction. You can't install them at the same time. A mo maybe more common example than just a, a, an accidental name collision would be forks of software. You may have a, uh, one software and then another, somebody else forked the software, they changed the name of the project, but they still have the same command, uh, and then Maybe, maybe it was a contentious forking, maybe not, and neither project's like, nope, we're owning the name, or, or even we have to have this file path because the way the software is written, it expects this in every artifact of this other thing. Different real world examples I'm bringing up, but in the end, you can make those two packages conflict with each other, so that way DNF understands that they can't be installed at the same time. Obsoletes, that is a relationship where you're telling the, telling the system that one package is going to replace another package. Uh, that might be used for if you're renaming a package. Uh, like let's say, um, I know this isn't how it worked, but let's say you had a wget package and you wanted to replace it with a wget2 package. Uh, I know Neil wants to jump in because that's, that's not how the wget2 project worked, that's not what it was, but anyways, if you wanted to replace one with the other, you could use the obsoletes in the second to say this is going to replace the first package. Sure, eventually, eventually it will. Okay, so yeah, it'll, yeah. So Neil brings up the fact that um, the DNF project itself is going under, undergoing some changes. Where uh, DNF itself is version four, they've been working on a DNF ver a new major version five. But the way they're doing it is basically putting five in the project name and in the binary name, and they're going to have sim links. Uh, user bin DNF is going to be a sim link to user bin DNF DNF five. Um, 
but it is also at the same time replacing an older project called MicroDNF that was used in containers. It was basically a DNF with no Python dependencies that could only install packages. Not, I don't even think remove them or do other more advanced stuff, but super lightweight, great for installing stuff in containers. Uh, DNF5 is part of DNF5, the DNF5 rewrite is to remove the Python dependency, re the rewrite mostly in C++. There's still some Python stuff, but the, uh, the core executable is going to be slimmed down and replace the functionality of micro DNF entirely. So they're having DNF5 obsolete micro DNF. That's, one, that's a good real world example of it. Um, provides is another relationship. This one's, um, this one's cool. It lets you allow other packages to refer to your package by another name. Um, and that's kind of a vague way to describe it, but the real world example to make it concrete is uh, you could have a package that needs a web server installed, uh, but you don't care which web server, you just need a web server. You, you want a web server to be installed for this software. You could have um, web servers in Fedora and CentOS actually all provide the name web server. So the HTTPD package, the Apache web server, provides web server, just the name web server. Nginx provides web server. Caddy provides web server. So you can have another package require web server and have that dependency satisfied by any of the other web servers. Uh, doesn't matter. If you don't already have it installed, it's, I don't remember how exactly it picks ones. I think it might pick the one with the highest version. Alpha, okay, yeah. It, it, it lexicographically does alphabetically on the name first. At one point I thought it picked the one with the highest version, but that's not correct. It, Neither does picking one by first alphabetical either, but no, I don't have one like that. A A A A <laughs> web server. <laughs> um, yes, but it allows you to have like install the uh, the web server first, or in the same transaction explicitly name which web server you want to install, and then that that package will provide the web server name that satisfies the dependency of the other thing. So that's where provides come in. It also comes. Th I'm not hitting everyone. <laughs> I've never, legitimately never heard of that. So I'm up here learning things as I'm giving it. <laughs> Apparently there's one called build conflicts and I'm gonna have to look into that later because it's not a RPM 101 level thing. The thing you gave as an example for requires, uh, uh, for conflicts at runtime where you have like multiple providers the same thing but you know that one is not good, can also apply at build time. Because, like, for example, um, a good example of this is the user bin convert, as you started and stopped with, yeah, is owned by Image Magic, Graphics Magic, and, like, four other different things. But, like, they, they, they change only in our package. Upstream, they still do user bin convert. So, yeah, no, you get to have fun with that. Um, but if you wound up having a situation where there's multiple theoretically identical providers that are actually not, you need a way to tell it not to pick that. And so build conflicts is the way you do that. So the same way you tell it to not pick something at runtime, you can also tell it to not do something at build time. I would just do an exact build requires. You should hopefully never need build conflicts. Yes. More advanced things. The, and this is not going to be conclusive, all of the possible tags. If you are interested in those, rpm.org has the full docs for every possible thing. Uh, this is entry level 101. So no more obscure new things for me. Don't make the presenter look bad. <laughs> Sorry, this might be an uh, obscure one as well. But um, do you, in CentOS, do you, do you have to care about uh, multi-lip um, conflicts as well? Like two packages, like 64-bit um, and 32-bit and what you try to upgrade one without the other and, and then you get weird conflicts. So I don't know a lot about multi-lib. I'm sure I could hand the mic to Neil and he could talk for 30 minutes about it, but we're not gonna do that, <laughs> yes. Uh, multi-lib is a thing where, uh, it's specifically for libraries, so that way you can have both like a 32-bit and 64-bit version of the library installed at the same time. Um, I think for the most part, those get the conflicts worked out automatically because the, there's user lib versus user lib 64. So I think most of those are just resolved by being in a different parent directory. Yes, data files in common could cause a problem there. And I don't know how that's resolved in multi-lib actually. Let's, let's talk about that more afterwards. That's, that's beyond, 
Good question. Beyond the scope of this yeah. workshop. <laughs> yes, yeah, so let's just get rid of 32 bit. That solves the problem. <laughs> All righty. Uh, so, more fields in the preamble. Uh, we've got the description. I mentioned before that some projects will have like a, a short and long description upstream. Uh, this is where you'd put the long description. It can span multiple lines. It can be multiple paragraphs if you want. Doesn't really need to be that long. Um, really, the target for this is when someone does. If you do just like DNF search on the command line, you'll get that short summary listed next to the package name. If you do DNF info on the package name, you'll get the summary and the longer description. Uh, some software doesn't really describe their software that much, and so you just use the summary with a period at the end for the description. Yeah, or make up your own. Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll try to get like the first paragraph of the upstream readme, uh, or maybe, maybe massage it down to the first few lines, something like that. Uh, but it's whatever you want it to be to describe the package in DNF info output, basically. And then what a little bit more advanced thing that uh, you can do is uh, what's called sub-packages. Uh, you might have seen this before if you've seen, um, I'm trying to think of a simple library. Uh, let's say you've got lib pcap, and then you also have a lib pcap devil package. Those are, it's the same software, but you're splitting up the development files into one package and the main library files into the other package. Um, some distributions keep those all in one package and get bigger packages because of that, but in RPM, it's standard practice to split those things up for the use case uh, because everyone that needs the library present doesn't need all of the development files present. Uh, so you would have a devil sub package where you place those different things and you control that by adding a package and description section in that preamble. Um, and each of those, the package one starts a new preamble uh, and then the description just goes along with it. So you could say these are the development files that go along with this and it has this other uh, runtime requirement you have to have installed. Um, the name there, one interesting note, that's not gonna be the full package name. By right there in that format, if you just put a name there, that'll be appended to the main package name where you have like foo and foo dash devel. Um, you could also do an arbitrary name completely separate from the main package name if you add the dash in flag in the middle there. So you could say like you have package foo with uh, a uh, package bar as a sub package and it's not immediately apparent that they're related because it's not a suffix. Uh, so you usually wouldn't want to do that. You'd have your sub packages named with just the suffix there. That's a little bit more advanced. I don't. I don't remember if we have that in the lab or not. Oh, we do, I think, for the Python lab. No, actually, I take that back. No, the Python lab doesn't have that. So you won't see that in the lab, but it is good to know about. And if you've seen those type, like development packages or separate packages like that, uh, that's where that comes from. That's how you define that. So the spec file body. Uh, this, is, uh, this is where we're really getting the meat of the build process. The prep section. That's going to be where you unpack the source code archive, the tar gz file. Uh, you need those files extracted. And then you would also apply any patch files to those. Like, let's say you have a patch that changes, you know, fixes a bug from upstream or adds a, a, a fix for a security problem. Anything like that, you're going to be applying that during the prep section. And we have that helpful auto setup maker I mentioned earlier. We'll apply all of your patches for you without you doing it, having to manually go through with the patch command. It's really useful. The next section is build. And it's exactly what it sounds like. That's how, what you're going to run to build the software. Uh, those make, helper makers I mentioned earlier, like, uh, like make, make, build, and make install, those would correspond to the build and the next one, the install section. Um, whereas build, that's where you're compiling the software usually. Install is where you're going to place those built artifacts into a directory tree that uh, it was called what we call the build root, but it's going to be simulating the, the file system structure on the target system. So inside your build root, there'll be a subdirectory, you know, US, U, user bin, user lib, all of those things, and you'll place those files where they need to go in that subdirectory structure, and then that becomes the top-level structure in the target system when you install it. And then finally, there's a check section. Uh, that's not exactly building the software, but that's where you can run uh, any kind of commands to test the software. Uh, upstream unit tests work really well here. Uh, you might want to do like a functional test where like you run the command and check for some kind of output. Um, in, really anything you want to test the software functionality. Two more. I think we're going to get to the lab soon. 
uh, the file section. Files and changelog work differently than those other sections. The the prep um, the prep through check section. Those were those are basically bash scripts. Uh, these ones, files and changelogs. These are text and in a particular format. The files one that is a list of the files that are going to be installed on the target system, like user bin foo and then user shared doc foo. Whatever whatever files you're going to have on the target system, you just list those the full path to those right there. Uh, the changelog that's in a specific changelog format. You'll see it in the lab. Um, that's where you're going to record changes that have happened to the package between the different versions and the different releases. You don't have to be overly verbose there. Uh, it could be as simple as updated to the new version. I've seen some packagers where they try to jam in the entire upstream changelog in there, and that's, that's not what that's for. Uh, Fedora package guidelines actively discourage against doing that. Uh, or might actually forbid it, now that I remember it. Yeah. 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 Uh, you should, it should be fairly, fairly short. You could link to an upstream change log, things like that. But it's more, if someone runs you know, rpm-q-change log on their system, what do you want them to see? Do you want to see, do you want them to see a thousand lines of upstream commit message messages? Probably not. You want to see them to see like, hey, I there's this new upstream version and I added this sub package or I uh, patched out this problematic sub command or plugin, whatever. Things that would be relevant to the end user immediately. Sure. Neil. Sure. I was like, where's my mic runner? <laughs> I got a lab helper and a mic runner. For the files macro, is there a way to automate a long list of files that need to be installed? Let's say your your make outputs 100 files or something like that. That's yes. A fantastic yes. There are lots of ways to do that. Uh, so. I know, for example, uh, in the file section, you could do, we haven't talked about this slide yet, skipped ahead. So in the files, at the file, um, the name, the start of it, you could do percent files, dash F, and then a file name, um, a local file name that's in there in the build process. If your build process can write out the, those list of files, uh, I know systemd makes really heavy use of this in their package. That's another one, yeah. So S systemd does that. So during the build process, systemd writes out that this component of systemd has all of these files in these locations, and you can uh, save that output into a text file just during the build process, not part of the package installation, and in the file section, just say uh, files-f this temporary file during the build, and it injects everything of that file contents into that. Um, there's other macros. Uh, another way, instead of listing every file exactly, uh, we'll get into that in... Yeah, there's a recursive way in there. I'll talk about that in the next slide, but there's another question. But there's several different ways to go about it. Um, yeah. No, one more. Yeah, for the backporting, is it recommended for, like, tracking purposes? Because, like, in Git, you can, like, cherry pick commits, and it'll tell you, like, this commit was cherry picked from this upstream commit. Do you recommend in the change log to do something similar? Like, for backporting a CVE, maybe you'll put, like, the CVE number, but, like, mm -hmm. would you ever put, like, a commit to say, like, this was the upstream that I'm backporting? So, or? Yeah, it's a little bit of dealer's choice. Um, there's definitely best practice around it. Like, for example, you're backporting a patch that fixes a specific CVE. You would want to put that CVE identifier. People look for CVE identifiers and change logs. Uh, that's a great example of something you would do. Um, I wouldn't just copy the upstream commit message in entirety and put that. That's probably, even, even if it's one line, that's probably too verbose. What I, personally, what I'll typically do if I'm pulling a patch from upstream is I will write um, uh, add patch to change or fix this thing, uh, you know, backported from upstream or something along those lines. Or even better, rather than just say added patch for this thing, and then a link to like a Red Hat Bugzilla number with more information. Uh, so it's really good, really good for putting URLs or like a sh like the bug number. It's really good for that. Um, I've seen some packages where they will reference like an upstream pull request number uh, and say like this is a backport of this upstream pull request that fixes this thing. Maybe they also have a CV identifier. Maybe not. Um, but yeah, it's it's dealer's choice. It's whatever you want to put there. I would say best practice is a uh, the shorter the better. You want it to be very terse and just a quick something you can look at on the command line and understand. 
you would never put like the upstream like. No, no, no. The patch content itself doesn't go in the change log. That the patch itself is in that patch file, uh, the one we referenced. Oh yeah, you can just okay. Yeah, there we go. You would have the patch in a file like uh, for the git. If you did git format patch, that gives you a patch f file in like mailing format. You save that as a patch file, and during prep, it applies that to the source code, uh, and in the change log, you just describe what you did in as high level term as possible. Like I'm a I'm backporting this patch for this thing. So some real world advice here t for what, what I usually do is if I'm backporting a fix or adding a patch or in a feature or, or security bug or whatever, um, I will take the commit, I'll take the commit back as a patch, put it in as a patch line, and I'll put a comment line right above and say from, and either put a URL or the commit ish or the reference to pull request or whatever, because that detail is useful there when you're looking at the details. Um, in the change log, I'll just reference, as Carl said, the very shortest form possible to explain it because the way you gotta think about change logs is that it's some dude who's possibly looking from an SSH terminal remotely on possibly his phone and needs to be able to read it. And from that perspective, you should make it the shortest, tersest, while still being understandable, that you can possibly do because that dude is not going to suffer through reading a whole bloody git log on, on his phone. The, le the level of verbosity is something to think about there. Um, another follow-up point of what he was saying, uh, referencing like an upstream pull request or commit. Um, in Fedora policy, Fedora and Red Hat in general, across the, the ecosystem of distros we have, uh, we have a policy of upstream first. And what that means is that we don't want to have changes that are just special to us. We work upstream first. I mentioned that a lot of the RHEL maintainers are also involved all the way through CentOS, Fedora, and the upstream projects. They're doing stuff in the upstream, they're getting those changes there, and everything else is like soft forks of management of what combination of these upstream commits we're gonna do. It's really what it comes down to. Um, but whenever you're doing a backported patch, you, uh, in the Fedora packaging guidelines, in, in line with that upstream first policy, if you're adding a patch in Fedora, there's a should requirement. The, there's an RFC, I forget the number, but should versus must terminology, where you should, unless you have a really good reason, have a reference to where that backported patch came from. And if it's something you came up with yourself or got from somewhere random, you need to work to get it in the upstream project because it's very annoying to have a huge long list of patches. Every patch you're maintaining uh, in your package is making your soft fork a little bit more of a soft fork, a further divergence. Um, and that can be very difficult to manage. The much more responsible way to handle it is to get that upstream, I maybe even get it, uh, get it from upstream in the first place, so that way the next version of the software that comes out has that patch built in and you just drop the patch file. That lets you stay at zero or one or like single digit patches and drop them as time goes on. Um, but then for some longer life distros like CentOS itself, you're gonna have th the opposite of that where I do have to keep systemd on the same version or the kernel on the same version and you end up with hundreds or even thousands of patches. <laughs> but those are also, those are going upstream first. They're not just secret sauce, Red Hat things, um, or CentOS things in that case. They are things that are from the upstream project. Uh, there's, not, there's not value in having the, keeping those to CentOS or RHEL specifically, or even Fedora. Fedora has the same, Fedora can backport stuff sometimes. Um, you might see it where new, new uh, version of the software, it has the fix that we want, security or otherwise, but because of the way that change stuff, maybe a config file change or a library change, it's only appropriate to put that into Fedora Rawhide. Because Fedora releases also have a updates policy where you're not supposed to make big changes. Uh, it's just shorter life cycle, the, six, the 13 months versus like five or 10 years. So older Fedora releases might get a backported security fix that get dropped in the next Fedora release because they're included in the next version. All right. So, that, that answer the question mostly? All right. All right, we'll keep going. Uh, where were we? The file section, I believe. Yeah, the file section. Yeah. So, different adders, adders is the last point, but yes. Uh, in files, each of those lines, uh, you can proceed it by a different uh, attribute. The dir uh, percent dir, that'll just say, own, the, own this directory that I'm giving you, but not its contents, non-recursively. If you just listed a directory, 
by default, it's going to include the directory and everything underneath that directory. Um, think like user include foobar. Uh, if you just put that in there, it's going to include that directory and every file underneath there, like the PC file and other stuff in there. But if you did, um, but if you did the dir on user include foobar, you won't get any of those files underneath the directory, just the fi the directory itself. And you may think, well, if there's files in there that I did in the build process, I want those pulled in the package somehow. Um, where that really comes in handy is where the package splitting thing, where you want some files in, in this sub package and other files in this other package. Dir gives you a lot of flexibility so you can say, the top level package owns all of the directories and these sub packages own the files in those directories and they may be different sub packages owning different files there. So it gives you a lot more granular control. Config lets you mark something as a configuration file. Um, and it has a really weird uh, kind of dumb default, and I don't know the historical reason why, but uh, if you just put config in front of the file, it marks it as a config file, but whenever you uh, update the software, if the config file changed in the output of like the build system, it's going to replace all the local configuration when you install the package, which is almost never what you want unless the config file format has completely changed and the local config file is basically worthless. Um, when it does that, it'll all, it will save the, uh, save the old config file it's replacing as a .rpm save file. So it's not completely obliterated, but it's moved out of the way and might surprise people. Almost always, you'll want to use the next one, config with the parameter of no replace. That means, and you've probably, if you've ever seen RPM new files on RPM based systems you're managing, that's where that comes from. There's a new config file thing. Could be as simple as they changed a comment at the top or they added new default directives, new sections, things like that. But that will create the, uh, create the config file uh, in, with a .rpm new suffix, which is a signal to like the system maintainer that, hey, you've got a new config file and it's up to you to merge in the changes, but your existing one is probably still compatible with the software and things will keep working. Um, but it, if, I forget the exact, I think RPM conf, there's a tool that lets you find all of your RPM new files and RPM save files on your system and go through and merge them and manage them. Uh, or you just do it by hand. Uh, but yeah, config no replace is almost always what you're going to want to use. Nobody likes their config file getting clobbered on purpose. Uh, adder is another thing you can prefix the line with. That lets you set the uh, non-default permissions or ownership of, uh, of things. All right. Some attributes will take relative, uh, will accept relative pass, which can be, uh, which will copy the file into the build root itself. Most of them you're expecting to already be in the build root from your install section, and you're just listing where the file is. But license and doc, you can give it a relative path to like the license file in the tarball, and that maker will copy it into user share licenses or user share doc, uh, and also mark it appropriately as a license file or a documentation file. For a long time, we only had the doc macro, and the difference between these is that uh, you can skip documentation files. You can't skip license files because most licenses have a clause that you have to distribute the license with the software. So that's what the difference, the key difference is there. So creating spec files. You may want to create these from scratch. Um, you could also copy a similar spec file and adjust as needed. That's real common. Some text editors have automatic templates. Like, for example, if you use Vim and you just type vim foobar.spec, it'll inject a basic skeleton of an RPM spec file. Just automatically it understands the template. Uh, other text editors have similar mechanisms. Uh, the tool you're going to use, uh, actually, you don't use this one in the lab. We use another one. But there's a tool called RPM Dev New Spec uh, from that RPM Dev Tools package from the first lab. That'll create a spec file from a template also and just output it. Similar story with change log entries. Um, I mentioned that's you know the description between each version and release of the package as it changes over time. You could write them by hand. Uh, you could copy the previous change log entry and then adjust it. You could use text editor plugins to inject it. But then there's a tool. You will use this one in the lab uh, called RPM Dev Bump Spec. What that's going to do is uh, it'll either it'll add the change log entry with whatever comment you pass that that command, and it'll also at the same time. Uh, adjust the release and maybe even the version if you need to um, along with what changes you're passing into that command. And you'll see that in, oh, I thought the lab was the next slide. <laughs> it's going to transition right into it. So, but we're also going to, this is also about building RPMs. Um, we're going to build them with the RPM build command. 
That expects the directory structure we made in the first lab, the RPM dev setup tree. We've got various build modes. Uh, BS is going to build the source RPM from spec file and sources. BB is going to build your binary RPM from spec file and sources. BA is going to build both. And then uh, there's also another mode called rebuild that t rebuilds an RPM from a source RPM. Quality checking RPMs. Uh, during the first lab, you install the RPM lint command. That is a linter that will check spec files, source RPMs, and RPMs. Uh, it'll identify real common packaging errors. It's not mandatory to resolve all of those errors and warnings, uh, but it is good to try. Uh, but it does flag real common mistakes. Um, but just understand that it's not always going to be possible. During the lab, uh, some of the first examples don't have a man page with the program that you're going to package. And you'll get a warning in RPM lint that says, warning, no man page. Don't freak out. That's normal. Uh, it just happens sometimes. But that is a good indicator if you're packaging some real software on the internet and it tells you, hey, no man page. You might think, does the software have a man page and should I be including it? They do. Let me add that. Or I checked and they don't. I'm going to file an issue and ask them to write a man page. Or write the man page myself and contribute it upstream. So along with the RPM lint, you can also use the RPM command itself to, for querying packages. Um, most of the time when you're doing packaging work, you're not going to have these packages installed directly on your system. It's real common for package maintainers to be targeting a different operating system than what they're building on. Um, and we'll talk about that in the last lab with a real cool tool called Mock. But you can use, um, for an uninstalled package, you can use the RPM command, uh, use the pack dash dash package flag, and that'll let you query information. Um, a lot of people might have done like RPM dash QI on an installed package before to show you the information about a package you have installed. You can do the exact same thing on a local package file that hasn't been installed by using the dash dash package flag. Uh, some other flags that go along real good with that for inspection, dash dash info, list, your requires, provides, uh, those are going to be uh, dumping out the relevant type of metadata that you're asking for on the command line there. So let's get into the next lab. More hands on so I'm stop, not droning on as much. Uh, we're gonna, y'all are gonna package the, a piece of software called Bello. Uh, that is just a, a dorky little name for a hello world program written in bash. Um, go ahead and click start on your lab. And I know the people that came in late, if y'all wanna join us, I'll show, you, I'll show you the URL. But for everyone else, go ahead and get started on the Bello lab and then stop whenever you, you hit the next button or after you click next. So people that are just coming in, uh, not to call you out for being late to class, it's fine. <laughs> but if you want to join in on the workshop, uh, this URL here will take you to the hands-on lab if you have a laptop to work on it. Um, it'll be up after the workshop, so if you just need to take, write it down and do it again later, you can. Uh, it'll walk you through all these labs. There's lecture that goes along with it, but there should be enough instructions there along the side that you can get caught up if you want to. And if you have questions, if you're doing the lab and have questions, just raise your hand. Somebody with a mic, will, don't need the mic, but somebody will come around and help you.
I want to let you all know that uh, we're on a little bit more of a time crunch than I expected originally due to some great questions that I don't mind at all, just over my minimum budget for time. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about another uh, uh, packaging thing that we need for the next lab and then open up the next lab so anyone that has already done with the Bello lab can start on the next lab. If you're still working on Bello, just kind of listen with one ear. This is a fairly, the next slide's fairly simple and then get to the next lab when you get to it on your time. If you run out of time doing the lab, uh, you're not really gonna run out of time. The, uh, the scale folks told me that there's nobody in this room after us, so we can actually go over and keep working. Or if you just have to get somewhere else and want to uh, write down that URL and finish the lab another time, that's also an option. But keep working on Bello if you're still in that lab. Um, but I'm gonna tell you about something that you'll need for the next lab, which is installing build requirements. For Bello, there were none. It's just a bash script. Everything that's in the default environment is all you need to just get that file copied uh, and then you're done. RPM build, uh, it needs all of the build requirements that are listed in the spec file to be installed on your build host. Uh, and you can do that either manually, just ahead of time, just install those by hand one by one. But if there's a lot of them, it's a lot easier to use a command called DNF build depth. Um, and you will see that directly in the cello lab with an example of the exact usage so I don't have to walk you through it. Uh, so when you finish the Bello lab, click next and go on to the cello lab, which is appropriately a hello world program written in C. And actually, there, there's no more lecture before the third lab, which is also a hello world program, but written in Python. So just move through those labs as you get time. Do not feel, do not feel like I'm rushing you. If you have questions, just raise your hand and we'll come by and, uh, and get you on track. Uh, don't get too bogged down if something's not making sense. And then there'll be one little last piece of, I'll give that a little bit of time to not overload you. There's one little last piece of lecture about a tool called Mock and then a final lab on Mock. We'll save that for like the last 10 minutes.
when everyone's uh, head down, working through the labs, get going smoothly? All right. Here, I'll give you a couple more minutes just working freehand, and then uh, I'm going to give you a quick little slide about what the mock tool is, and then tell you about the last lab, and then you can just finish when you finish. one more slide of lecture uh, to tell you about a really cool thing. So 
during all these labs, you all have been using the RPM build command. Now I want you to throw all that away because you're not going to use that normally. I'm halfway kidding, but uh, there are drawbacks to using RPM build directly. Uh, I mentioned that with the DNF build dev thing, your build requirements have to be installed on your host machine, on your build host. Um, it's also really easy that if you have a build requirement that is already installed, to forget to list it as a build requirement. Like if you have, like if your software needs GCC to build the package, and you have GCC installed for some other reason, and you build your package, and you don't list build requires GCC, somebody else that tries to build it uh, might it might fail to build because that you didn't list it as a build requires. So it's entirely too easy to get in that situation whenever using RPM build directly. Um, you can also only build RPMs targeting the same operating system and operating system version as your build host. So your build host there in that lab, it is a, a CentOS Stream 9 system. Uh, and so you really can only build tar RPMs that officially target that. You might be able to make an RPM that accidentally installs on another version or on another distro like Fedora, but it's not guaranteed and you might you'll probably run into library stuff eventually that uh, for not targeting not targeting correctly. But there is a, a solution for that, and it's called mock. Uh, and that lets you build RPMs in isolated cheroots. Uh, it does it still uses RPM build internally in its guts, but uh, it gives you the benefit that your build requirements are not installed on your host. They're installed inside that cheroot and then discarded when you're done with the build. That'll help you identify any missing build requirements because in that cheroot, it is a very stripped down minimal, just the bare minimum structure uh, for getting a build done. And it'll tell you like, I also need these development libraries or this compiler installed to complete the build. Um, even more importantly than that, that's a great benefit on its own, but it also lets you build RPMs that target different operating systems or operating system versions as the build host. Uh, uh, Limited, right? Like, there's some limited support for doing different architectures, but you have to have cross compile support, I think. Mm. Okay, so that's gotten better then. So yeah. there are also ways you can use mock to do architecture, different architectures, but that's, yeah, you probably won't be doing that. Yeah. Um, those truths that it makes are also automatically created and removed and managed, so you don't have to really think about it. It's just you might end up with a fairly large varlib mock directory over time that sometimes you might want to purge manually. Um, mock is really widely used in, in our ecosystem. Uh, it's the Koji build system that Fedora uses, uh, uses mock inside of it. Uh, the copper build system in Fedora also does uses mock, so they have a standard back end essentially. The Fedora Fed package tooling, if you get into being a Fedora packager, it also, um, it also integrates really well with mock. And that's what you're going to learn about in the next lab. Uh, you're going to build the Pello package again, but you're going to use mock to do it. And instead of building it for EL9, the same as the, your, uh, your build host, you're actually going to build it to target EL8 instead and then inspect the results. Enterprise Linux, and the answer is yes. CentOS Stream is the reference implementation of Enterprise Linux. Going. Um, we're close to the end of our official time. Keep working on the lab if you if you need to. Um, I'll still be here for. I'll basically be here till they kick us out. But one other thing I want to bring up is uh, if this was interesting to you and you enjoyed these labs, then I would encourage you to consider becoming a Fedora and slash Apple Packager. Um, this URL, URL here, bit.ly slash Fedora Packager, that'll take you to a page in the Fedora documentation about becoming a Packager. Uh, Coincidentally, that is great background for getting involved contributing to CentOS as well, because it's a lot of overlap in these ecosystems, these communities. 
and the tooling the tooling's mostly the same across and it's all relevant and connected so uh, if this like 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 me if it scratches an itch in your brain where this was interesting and exciting to you check this out and uh, I hope to see you around Fedora and Apple and CentOS spaces um, that's basically the end of the, the stuff but keep working on the labs I don't know if Sean wants to say last words for the overall thing no not last words I just want to say like if you have uh, you take this back and you then have more questions and you want to find Carl, there is a CentOS booth. Uh, exhibit hall opens tomorrow afternoon, I think, or whatever. So there's a CentOS booth. Okay, we'll be there. Like yeah. There's also a Fedora booth that you can go visit and, you know, people there know stuff too. So there is both a Fedora and a CentOS booth and a Red Hat booth, apparently. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, you don't have to get out of here. Uh, you don't have to go home, but you have to get the hell out of here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be here till they kick us out. Uh, if you want to keep doing the labs, feel free. We ran a little over on some of the lecture. My fault. So we will uh, will be available and and or write down those URLs. It was uh, bit.ly, hello RPM, and Fedora Packager were the two URLs to get to the to the hands-on lab and to the uh, become a Packager documentation. If you want those again, um, yeah, I'll be here. If you have more questions on the lab, just raise your hand.